These are just a few of the more than 100 million automobiles currently using this country's highways. To run them requires more than 100 billion gallons of gasoline every year. Gasoline is so readily available that you may forget how dangerous it can be. It's an explosive fuel designed specifically to be burned in the internal combustion engine. It's not designed to be used as a cleaning agent. With a fire extinguisher standing by, I'll show you why. Gasoline is one of the most dangerous chemicals you can have around the house or around the garage. Uh, here are some of the reasons why. This is a pint or so of gasoline, and here's a source of spark. Watch. The spark is heating the gasoline to boiling, but because there's no air, there's no flame. Now it's in the area of gasoline vapor, which is heavier than air and invisible, but because there's no air, there's no flame. Watch when you get up near the top where the air is. So the reason gasoline is so dangerous is that its vapor is heavier than air, so it flows along the floor. It's invisible, so you don't know it's there, and a tiny spark or a pilot light can set it off. And it's amazing how much energy there is in just a few drops of gasoline. I'll put some inside this can. One, two, three, four. Add a little oxygen, air. Now one small spark and watch. And that was just a few drops of gasoline. So never use gasoline as a cleaning agent and keep it in the gas tank of your car. This is Don Herbert. To produce the electricity Americans need in one year takes 450 million tons of coal, 560 million barrels of oil, and 3 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. How about making some of this electricity from wind power? Well, 70 years ago, farmers could order windmills for mail order catalogs, and every farm or ranch had its windmill. Today, they've almost disappeared. With the energy shortage, will they make a comeback? Well, you've been reading a lot about wind power, here are some of the latest developments. Putting the wind to work to make electricity is relatively easy. The moving air spins the blades of a propeller, which is turning a generator that's producing electricity. Of course, to make this wind blow, I'm using more electricity than the generator is producing, so this setup isn't very efficient. But how about the real wind? Can it efficiently produce electricity for everyday use? To find out, Erda, now a part of the Department of Energy, and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration have constructed the world's largest operating wind turbine in Sandusky, Ohio. The blades are 125 feet from tip to tip. Why so big? Well, every time you double the length of the blades, you get a fourfold increase in power output. So within practical limits, the bigger, the better. The blades start to turn when the wind reaches eight miles per hour and continue to rotate at a constant speed of 40 revolutions per minute. Inside the turret is a generator that produces 100 kilowatts of electricity, enough for 30 average homes. A similar turbine is producing twice that much for a power company grid in Clayton, New Mexico. An even larger version is being planned for Boone, North Carolina. As the efficiency and cost effectiveness of wind turbines improve, they could supply five to 10% of our country's electrical needs by the year 2000. Then the electricity to run a fan inside your house could come from the wind blowing right outside. This is Don Herbert. When you think of dangerous weather, tornadoes and hurricanes come to mind. But lightning, too, can be a very destructive weather force. Each year, lightning kills about 150 Americans. Tornadoes claim about the same number of lives, and hurricanes half that many. Lightning also damages property. For instance, millions of dollars worth of timber are destroyed annually by lightning-caused forest fires. One way to study lightning is to make some. That's up next.
This man-made lightning is very similar to lightning in nature. They're both electrical sparks. Now, to jump across a gap like that takes tremendous electrical pressure or voltage. The scientists have found to jump across one inch of dry air like that takes 25,000 volts. With lightning, the sparks have to jump much longer distances, as long as eight miles for bolts from a cloud of the Earth and up to 100 miles between two clouds. So the electrical pressure in lightning is enormous. It can be as high as 100 million to 1 billion volts. How about harnessing lightning for electrical power? Well, unfortunately, almost all of this electrical energy is dissipated into heat and light and thunder, and no way has been found to harness it for useful power. Scientists use various techniques to study lightning. For example, Richard Orville of the State University of New York took this photo through a prism-like device, which made the color bands on the left. The bands give clues to the type of particles in the path the lightning took through the air. The destructive force of lightning is well known, but lightning is also beneficial. It releases nitrogen from the atmosphere, and raindrops carry the nitrogen into the soil, where plants use it for growth. Some scientists believe it was lightning that furnished the energy when the first life was created on Earth billions of years ago. The frightening and awesome electrical spark from the clouds, lightning. This is Don Herbert. A burning kitchen match. You can think of it as sort of a unit of heat, not a very scientific one perhaps, but a good way to remember what a BTU is. You see, BTU stands for British Thermal Unit and is the amount of heat necessary to raise a pound of water, it's about this much, from 63 degrees Fahrenheit to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Kind of a hard unit to keep in mind. So the next time you see that word BTU or those letters, just think of that much water being heated by a kitchen match and you won't be far from wrong. Here's 400 matches representing 400 BTUs. That's the amount of heat the average adult gives off every hour when at rest. Of course, if you're doing physical work or exercising, you're giving off much more heat than that. On a hot day, your air conditioner has to pump out not only this heat, but also some of the heat in the room. Here's a pile of 10,000 matches, representing the 10,000 BTUs the average air conditioner can pump outside every hour. Your furnace can be rated at 100,000 BTUs. That's a pile of matches 10 times this big. So the next time you're shopping for an air conditioner, a water heater, or a furnace. Look on the back of it or on the side of it someplace, you'll find a little plaque that tells you how many BTUs it uh, can give out every hour. And then think of this much water being heated by a kitchen match. This is Don Herbert. If you're an average American adult, you're probably a bit overweight and on the lookout for a new diet to help you lose a few pounds. Well, you know, foods like these are the kind to stay away from because they contain lots of calories. On the other hand, these foods will help you shed those extra pounds because they're low in calories. Almost every diet designed to help you lose weight is based on calories. What are calories anyway? A little sugar explosion will give you a good idea what calories are. In that thimble, is a quarter of a teaspoon of sugar containing four calories. Now to get the calories out where you can see them, I've added a supply of oxygen in chemical form. Now I'll add a drop of water. As you can see, calories are units of heat. And in that quarter of a teaspoon of sugar were enough calories to create all that flame and even get the thimble red hot. Well, how do scientists know how many calories there are in sugar or any other food? Well, they burn them inside a bomb like this. In this little cup, they put a sample of the food, put it inside this bomb. They add a supply of oxygen and gas form and put it in this tank of water. And with this thermometer, they can read the temperature of the water. With an electric current, they fire the sample, which burns just like the sugar did, heats up the water. They measure the temperature of the water the higher it goes, the more calories. Now, if you eat more calories than your body needs, it's changed into fat, which is deposited in all the well-known places. Here's a teaspoon of flour. I've added the supply of oxygen. The next time you hear that word calorie, this will remind you they're units of heat.
This is Don Herbert. In a recent year, some 9,000 Americans were treated for eating poisonous plants. The Public Health Service thinks the total should actually be higher because many cases go unreported. And one of the reasons for this increase in plant poisoning is the back to nature movement. People mistakenly think they can go off into the woods and easily identify edible plants from the deadly ones. Wild plants aren't the only problem though. Common garden variety plants can be dangerous. Even plants available at the supermarket. I'll show you some examples that may surprise you. Morning Glory, Oleander, Daffodil, beautiful to look at, but deadly to eat. Plant poisoning is a growing problem because most people simply don't realize that many common plants can be deadly if you eat them. Here are some more examples of pretty common plants that are poisonous. The iris, the root contains a poison. The larkspur's leaf and seed are poisonous. So is the pod of the wisteria. And all parts of the rhododendron are poisonous. The castor bean plant is the source of castor oil, yet if an adult ate three of the plant's unrefined seeds, it would kill him. Even many edible plants have parts that are poisonous. For example, cooked rhubarb stalks are delicious, but eating rhubarb leaves, even in small amounts, can be fatal. You eat potatoes and tomatoes, yet the vines of both plants are poisonous. It's not a good idea to bite into the seeds of apples, peaches, uh, cherries, and plums, because their seeds contain a cyanide-forming chemical. One man had a habit of eating apple seeds like these. He died of cyanide poisoning. With the popularity of house plants today, chances are you have poisonous plants around your home. So don't eat any plant unless you know it's harmless. And teach your children the same, because most plant poisoning victims are under five years of age. So enjoy the beauty of plants with your eyes and not your tongue. This is Don Herbert. It's a condition all of us will experience. Its symptoms, the skin dries out, the joints stiffen, and muscles weaken. The kidneys decline in function, the lungs take in less oxygen, the heart pumps less blood, eyesight weakens, and the hearing gets poorer. The brain loses 100,000 cells a day, and the hair turns gray. As you probably guessed by now, the condition is called aging. Here's what scientists know about its causes and its cure. Whenever you see an old photograph of yourself, you may well ask, why do we all eventually show the effects of age? Well, scientists believe that some of the causes of aging may lie here in the DNA, the genetic code inside all cells. Instructions in the DNA program the cell to take in energy and materials and to make cell parts and products. Note there's no instruction for cell reproduction. This is the kind of code that controls the cells of your brain and muscles, including your heart. If they become damaged, no new cells can be produced and the whole organ can be affected, as happens in aging. In other cells, the instructions include the basic functions plus reproduction. Every few days, new cells of your skin are being produced, as well as hair cells in the lining of your intestine. Cells of other organs can reproduce themselves when necessary. But if the instructions become garbled, the cell's efficiency, including its ability to reproduce, declines, as it does in aging. With better understanding of how DNA controls cell functions, it may be possible to reprogram the instructions. Cells that don't ordinarily reproduce could be made to do so. The garbled code could be repaired, and cells continue to reproduce. The goal is to keep your body functioning as normally as possible, as you go through that inevitable process called aging. This is, and was, Don Herbert.